All right, guys, and we are live for episode 103 of the Endless Endeavor podcast. Um, Today is going to be a short episode, and again, it's another solo one. And the reason that I'm doing that is because I feel like there's a couple things that need to get addressed, and I want to use this platform that I've created to address them ASAP. Uh, We got some good episodes in the pipe that are going to be coming out, long format with with guests sharing some cool stories, but I wanted to get this out and I wanted to get it out now. And because there's a couple things that have been on my mind. The first one is, um, if you follow me on Instagram, you saw my post yesterday. It was about a coworker committing suicide. Uh, a lot of people that listen to this show also follow me on Instagram, but there are also people that follow me on one platform or the other. And for those of you that are podcast listeners, but you're not on social media, I wanted to use this opportunity to bring up some of those concerns and some of those ideas that I had regarding suicide, because it is an epidemic in our society. Um, you know, so I'll, I'll just kind of go right into it and then I'll share the same thing I shared on Instagram and then I'll unpack it a little more because this is long format and I can take as much time as I need. Uh, yesterday, I found out that a coworker of mine who was a police officer in Seattle with me committed suicide. And as I said on social media, this guy wasn't a friend of mine. This wasn't someone that I was close with. To tell you the truth, he was one of the people within my department, one of the few people I would say that I had a harder time getting to know. I'm a pretty extroverted person. I like communication. I like talking with people when we're in the lunchroom or if you're my partner for the day, I want to take that as an opportunity to get to know you. And I feel like that's important because I believe in fulfilling the tribal needs of just being a human being and the people to the left and the right of you are extremely important. And if you're going to share space and you're going to share time with people, I think it's worth your time and worth your energy to get to know who they are. And, and, and this individual was hard to get to know. He was always kind. He was always a good police officer. He was good at his job. Um, he is one of the people in the department that I don't think you would hear one person say something negative about. And I, I'm here to tell you that that's hard in that profession because there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, clicks and back and forths and disgruntled employees. So if you're a guy that is unanimously liked, that says something about you. But just because he was unanimously liked, wouldn't, I, I also wouldn't use that as, as the opportunity to say that he was friends with everybody because like I said, he was hard to get to know. And so I got the phone call yesterday that he killed himself and it immediately made me start thinking and feeling different emotions. And I started to wonder, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this has nothing to do with it, but I'm wondering if that was a reason why he was introverted and and, and reluctant to really break down walls and get to know each other and get to know you as a person. And, And it makes me wonder is if, if someone is behaving like that, do we use that as an opportunity to attempt to break down the walls and attempt to get to know them? Or is that just how some people are wired and, and it is what it is. And the, the truth is we'll never know when he was feeling extremely dark or depressed. If this has been a lifelong battle or if this is something that came on quick, because I've been out of the department for two years now, May 5th was two years since I was put on leave and I hadn't seen a lot of my coworkers since that date. And so as I sit here today and I think about going through the emotions of losing another person to suicide, it makes me think about what we need to do and how we can be better. This is the first person that I have known to commit suicide that wasn't a veteran with me. I think I've lost, and and the fact that I don't have a number kind of tells you how, how, what a regular occurrence this is becoming, but I've lost six or seven teammates in the last three years by their own hands. And, and he was the first one that was not someone that I shared time with overseas Outside of that, I don't know anyone that has committed suicide. 
So there is a, 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 a correlation to being a veteran and, and seeing combat and coming home and not being able to find a life that you find suitable for yourself. And why is that? And we're going to go into some of those things today. I've done podcasts on this before. And so if some of it's redundant, fucking turn your radio off. But I think these are things that are worth revisiting from time to time. And so, you know, everybody always says, do buddy checks, check in on your friends, see how they're doing. And I've been that person that's tried to do buddy checks before and, and one particular friend of mine who I knew was very dark and I knew was, uh, was battling some inner demons and going through some hard times with injuries, with a loss of a, a professional career. A lot of things started compounding on him all at once. And he expressed to me his desire to no longer live. And we talked about it. I checked in with him when I could and you know, days became weeks and weeks become months. And I hadn't talked to him in a month or two. And then I got the phone call. Hey, Jordan shot himself. And it's like, man, what if I'd stayed on top of him a little more? What if I'd taken the time to make check-ins a priority as opposed to something that, Hey, when it crosses my mind, I do it. Is it something you schedule? Uh, and I don't know what the answer is because I have so many veteran friends that have had some ups and downs doing, doing daily check-ins would be a full-time job. I'd need a fucking secretary. And so now what do I do weekly check-ins and is a check-in even going to change the trajectory of this person? Maybe, but I don't know. I think what's more important than a check-in and a, uh, hey, hey, you good? Yeah, I'm good. I, I think what's more important than that is a lifestyle change and a commitment to being better and a commitment to pursuing something you're passionate about. And in my opinion, that starts with the individual. That doesn't start with his friends and family. And so something that I've noticed is some of my friends that I've lost to suicide, they masked it so well to the point where you thought they were completely good. And if you think someone's completely good, what is going to incentivize you to do a check-in? If you think they're good, they're, they're doing check-ins on them isn't something that would even come to your mind. And so unless you're psychic or it is one of those scenarios where people are being very overt about their, their depression or their desire to no longer live, it becomes extremely difficult to know who needs your time, who needs your energy, who needs your love. And I'm a pretty perceptive person and I feel like I can tell when my friends are in need of my friendship and my energy. But that's also, I would say, applicable to the people that I share space with. If I can look at you in the eyes and I can hear your voice, I can get a pretty good idea if I'm close to you, how you're feeling that day, regardless of the words that you're sharing. But for a lot of our friends, and I'm sure this goes for all of you guys listening too, we have friendships that were built over the course of our lifetime, over the course of our journey. And it takes us all over the country, all over the world. And a lot of people that I still hold in the high regard that I consider great human beings that I'm fortunate to have a, a friendship with, that I'm fortunate to have a bond with, I might see them once every two years. They might live in North Carolina. And, and, and what you find is a lot of our powerful relationships that we've built with people through the military, especially it's one of those things where it's like, Hey, I'll see you when I see you. And that's all good. I'll see you when I see you means, man, you're important to me. I consider you a friend. I prioritize you as a person, but life goes on. We all got our families. We got our work. We got jujitsu. We got our uh, driving our kids to school every morning. Like life fills up fast. And I'll see you when I see you means that 
when the stars align for us to share space together again, you're still my brother or you're still my sister. And we pick up right where we left off. And I can tell you, I probably have 200 friends that fill that position that I don't speak with on a, even a monthly basis. I don't text with very often, but I know if I needed them, if something came up and I needed that to lean on them, or if I was local to their area and I needed a couch to crash on, or, or I was available to go get dinner, that that friendship would then be nurtured again. And what I find is a lot of my buddies that I've lost are friendships that are in that realm. They're not people that I'm interacting with on a regular basis. And if I took my 200 friends, and that's just a number, I didn't calculate anything, but if I took my 200 friends that I served with on various teams over the course of, of a decade overseas and, and being in the military, again, that's a full-time job. There's simply not enough hours in the day to see how everybody's doing. And some people are better than others at maintaining friendships, and I, I am no different, and I have an ebb and flow to it. Sometimes I feel like I'm on top of shit. And then sometimes I feel like, man, I haven't talked to Mitch in three weeks. Wonder what he's up to. And, and that's just kind of the ebb and flow of life. We all have these different things that are coming up and, and, and pursuits. And I'm putting tons of time into my property, tons of time into my jujitsu. And sometimes certain things get prioritized over others. So the whole reason that I'm saying what I'm saying is, in my opinion, short of seeing something overt, like your friend texting you, I don't feel like living anymore. Okay. When, when that text comes through, let's prioritize that person. Fuck, I'll get on a flight if I have to. But short of something that, that, that shines a spotlight on the problem, something that is a big red flag, short of that. I'm asking you guys as the individual veteran to be the person to take the steps to make sure you do express yourself to your friends and you do get the help that you need. You know, when you're in that spot as an individual and, and the spot I'm referring to is that dark, depressive state where you think, Nothing is going to work out. Your life is filled with pain and anguish. You're having a hard time paying the bills. You and the wife can't seem to align on anything. Or, or even maybe you and the wife have become roommates. You, you share space together, but you don't share emotion together. And once you're, emotion, you're in an emotional struggle with people, you're in a financial struggle it starts to spiral and it is hard to climb out of it. And, and sometimes as the spiral gets deeper and deeper, you start to tell yourself, what is the point of all this day in and day out? I find myself dealing with more pain and suffering than love and joy. Sometimes you reach a point where your life almost becomes devoid of love and joy. And once you don't, once you no longer share positive emotions and feel the, the chemical rushes that, that come with things like expressing joy or feeling love, it is easy to start to just feel like you're dead inside. And once you start to feel like that, the mind starts to say, well, why don't I just be dead outside as well? There's a lot of little, little things that your brain will tell itself to try and keep you in that depressive state or to try and encourage you to go darker. And I don't know why that is. I don't know what that is. I just know it to be true. Depression is like, it's like a, it's like a ball rolling downhill. It's like a snowball rolling downhill. And if you let it, it gains momentum 
and it gets bigger in size. And the bigger it gets, the more momentum it builds. And we all know what that means. That means the harder it's going to be to stop. But I want you guys to understand something. If you do take that final step to end your life, your pain stops. Your personal pain stops. But the pain does not stop. The pain that you were running away from, you simply transfer that to the other people in your life. You transfer that pain, that, that dark, depressive, agonizing pain. You transfer that to your children. You transfer that to your mother. You transfer that to your woman. And I really want you guys to think about this. And it may only be applicable to one listener out of the 35,000 downloads I get a month. Maybe one person is going to hear these words. And if you do, then this episode is worth its weight in gold. And I'm glad that I released it. But I want you to think about how you feel in this depressive state how much anguish you're in and how you would would literally do anything to get out of it up into pointing a gun at your head and pulling the trigger. But now I want you to think about all of that pain and anguish that you're feeling. And I want to, I want you to think about handing that over to somebody else. Do you want, your seven-year-old daughter to carry that pain around with her for the rest of her life? Your pain ended, but the pain didn't. And now it's hers to carry. And I can tell you from personal experience, I do know someone who when we were in the fifth grade, she found her own father hanging in the closet. And that has been something that has caused struggle and addiction and all kinds of different problems in her life throughout her entire life. And we're in our 40s now. Is that the future you want to give your daughter? Because you're unwilling to face the pain and defeat the pain. You have two choices. You either defeat the pain or you give it to somebody else. And I think we all understand without even having to verbalize it, that giving that pain to somebody else is unfair. And it's also unacceptable because you're giving somebody a burden And the only reason they're able to accept that burden is because they love you. So I want you to think about that. I've been very honest about my path in dealing with depression and dealing with insomnia. I've had the Glock to my head before. And it's like I'm fucking Jekyll and Hyde. Part of me saying, just do it, just do it, just do it, just do it. And then the other part of me says, what about mom? What about mom? And for me, that's the one person that I would think about and understand that if I did pull that trigger, that the amount of pain that I would transfer to her would be unbearable for her. I'm her only son. It would be so unbearable that it's likely the rest of her life she would be in anguish. And it made me realize I can't transfer that pain to her. It's simply unfair. 
So here's another thing that a lot of you guys tell yourself when you're in that state, because I've been in that state. You tell yourself that everybody will actually be happier when you're gone. You actually tell yourself that you're doing them a favor. You tell yourself that I can't provide for my kids. I'm struggling financially. I'm mad all the time. I'm pissed off at, at every driver on the roadway. I'm screaming, fuck you. You want to fight? Like my kids don't need to be exposed to that. And maybe if I'm gone, someone else will come into their life that gives them more positivity and more love. But the truth is, you can't step away from their life in this traumatic fashion and expect them to be able to open their arms to a new person and move forward unaffected and put that, that traumatic incident behind them. You will never put that traumatic incident behind you. And it's going to be lingering. And now it's their burden to carry. So I went through a lot of counseling. And at first I was embarrassed about that. I'm an army ranger. I got 14 combat deployments. I thought I was this tough savage. And now I'm talking to a woman about my emotions. I'm crying in front of a woman. And, and it was a, it was a, a hard step to take and counseling works for some people and it doesn't work for others. And I see both sides of that. And I'll tell you this, a counselor is no different than any other human being on planet earth. Some of them are great. Some of them suck shit. And then there's everything in between. But additionally, regardless of their own personal capabilities, you got to vibe with that person. Vibing is real. You have to be on the same frequency. You have to be on the same mission. And that is something that is outside of either party's control. I think our frequencies are set and some people you mesh with and some people you don't. So if you try the counseling route and it just doesn't seem to, to feel right and it doesn't seem to be giving you the right tools to be able to move forward, cease it and find a new one. Because I knew within 20 minutes that the person that I was sharing space, space with was here to help me. Genuinely concerned about moving me forward and putting light back into my life. I'm a veteran, so I have resources available to me that a lot of you don't. But don't let yourself stop because of convenience. Life is supposed to be inconvenient. Life is supposed to be hard. And if you've made the commitment to get better, start taking the steps to get better. But this is what I truly think the problem is. This is, tr this is the real reason why I think most veterans go through this. I don't think it has anything to do with shooting people in the face in Iraq. I don't think it has anything to do with IEDs going off and our bases getting bombed all the time. And I don't even think it has a lot to do with our brothers and sisters that we lost overseas. Now, don't get me wrong. Those are traumatic experiences and those are emotions and memories that we will hold on to forever. But I don't see that being the root cause of veterans spiraling out of control. I see the root cause of veterans spiraling out of control being that they've lost meaning and they've lost purpose. And from the age of 18 to 29, for me, my life revolved around being an army ranger, deploying, 
facing the enemy on the field of battle, sharing the battle space with my brothers. I had a mission that I felt was important. I thought I was serving something bigger than myself. And I've talked about this plenty of times. Hindsight being 2020, I don't think Iraq was serving something bigger than myself. I think Iraq was me being caught up in the military industrial complex, but I was too young to know it. But that is a moot point. Because perception is reality. And what I felt at the time was that I was in the, the right place, doing the right thing, risking everything to serve a bigger purpose with a bunch of people that shared those same values. And it felt like the pinnacle of being a man. And when you take that away from yourself through a conglomerate of different reasons, some people leave service because of injury. Some people leave service because of family dynamics. Some people leave service just simply because it's time to pursue something different. But regardless of why you left the team, you're no longer on the team. And when you're no longer on the team, you lose a sense of purpose and you lose a sense of value. And so there's one of two ways veterans go. They find a new path that's rooted in purpose and value. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you what it is for everybody, but I'll tell you what it was for me. And it's jujitsu. And we'll unpack that a little more here shortly. But the other route that veterans go is my life is not as amazing as it used to be. I'm not as important as I used to be. I'm not doing big things anymore. I used to be in charge of 20 men. I was a platoon sergeant raiding fucking Fallujah or whatever the story is. And now I'm stocking shelves at Home Depot. And people come up to me with bitchy attitudes and say, what aisle is the paint on? And you say, what the fuck am I doing? I don't feel important anymore. So if you don't feel important anymore and some other things in your life aren't going well, you probably start drinking alcohol, which is an additional depressant, and things just go from bad to worse, and then from worse to even more worse, and digging your way out of that hole is fucking hard. But if you're not willing to do it, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper until you convince yourself there is no way out. So I want you guys to think about a couple things. The first thing is to tell yourself that you don't add value to people's life or you no longer have value. It is also a lie that you tell yourself. Because what you bring to other people and their life and their experience and the energy you share with them, that is 100% up to you. So you get to dictate where you occupy your time and space and with who you occupy that time and space with and what you offer to them as a person. And if you don't think you have value, then figure out a way to have some value. What can you do for your friends? What can you do for your community? What can you do for the kids that, that are part of your community that don't have any after school activities? Start figuring out what your skills are and how to capitalize on them by giving to others. And I'm not even saying you have to volunteer your time. I give to others as a profession. I make money by sharing my passion with people and people are okay with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Exchanging time for money is what human beings do. 
If you're in the capacity to be able to give your time, then that's great. But if you're not, maybe your path is finding a way to share your passion and create a livelihood all in one. And I want you guys to understand that creating a jiu-jitsu academy that struggled for a long time, but has finally, after years of putting energy into it, it has finally exploded. And we're doing the best we've ever done. What I see on a daily basis is people with smiles on their faces, with people that are learning to overcome adversity, with people that are building friendships on the mats with the people to their left and their right. And these people over the course of, sometimes it's as short as a a week. Sometimes it takes a few months. There's a new light inside of them that's shining and I can see it in their eyes. And what I have created as an individual has had the ripple effect, like dropping a, a pebble into a pond. And that ripple reaches far and wide. And now I have almost 200 people who believe that I have created something that enriches their life. Now, this isn't a pat me on the back and, oh, look what Greg Anderson did. I'm simply saying this because you have to know as the individual that is in that dark place, that if you step outside of it, and you focus on good, and you focus on passion, and you focus on love, you too have the ability to add tremendous amounts of value to the people's life that you share time and occupy space with. Everybody has that. As a human being, you're doing one of two things. You are either adding value to people, or you are detracting value from people. Not many people, if any, sit in neutrality. So it's up to you as the individual to make that choice. Where do I want to fall on that scale? Do I want to be a value add or do I want to be a value detract? Because if you choose value detract, all that does is fan the flame of the downward spiral. But if you figure out a way to use your skill set, your energy, your knowledge, your capability to enhance the lives of the people that you're sharing this life experience with, that's when you start to find that everything that you're doing is impactful and it is meaningful and it feels good. And it's important that you are here to help those people and they need you and you need them. And it's a, it becomes a symbiotic relationship. But if you remove yourself from that relationship, you've broken what we're trying to create. And so I always like to leave the suicide talk with this. This is going to be a short episode and we're already at 33 minutes. But I like to leave the suicide talk with this. And this, is, this isn't coming from me. This is what my counselor said to me. Is that, Greg, right now you're in the storm. There's dark clouds all around you. You can see no light and you can feel no love because the storm has engulfed you. And when you're inside of the storm, you don't understand that on the other side of those clouds, the sun is waiting to shine its light on you again. And if you understand that the way you feel right now is a moment in time. It is a chapter of your life. It is not your life. It is not who you are. It is an experience that you are feeling. And that moment in time, maybe a day, maybe a week, fuck, it might be a year. But regardless of the duration of that moment, it is still a moment. And on the other side of that moment, the clouds break the sun will beam on you again and you can start experiencing love and joy and friendship. You have to know that because one, it's the truth. And two, if you don't have hope, you're already dead. So please, please, please think about the things that I said. 
The pain doesn't go away. You just transfer it to those that you love. And for that and that reason alone, it's not fucking fair. So if you know someone that's in a dark time, that's struggling, please send them this episode. Because one of the biggest things that I get from people when I talk about this stuff and I'm vulnerable and I share my truth, one of the biggest things that I get is, wow, man, I'm not alone. Others feel this way or others felt this way. You've walked in my shoes and now you've gotten out of it. Wow. So if you're a fucking man and you're this athletic, tough, martial artist, army ranger, whatever, whatever you want to attribute to yourself for making you feel like you're a badass, just know all that stuff is great. And I'm a proponent of that stuff. But the most badass thing you can do is show vulnerability and let people know that you aren't perfect and that you've struggled too. Because that gives them comfort knowing I'm not the only one and I'm not alone. And if you have walked a similar path as some of us, don't hide from it. Embrace it. It's a journey that you walk through. And if you're still here, that means you defeated that journey. Or rather, you defeated those demons within that journey. And that's something to be proud of. And that's something to share. And that's something to let other people witness. The other thing I wanted to touch on today in regards to the Texas shooting. A lot of people are sharing their thoughts on what happened there in regards to the police officers hesitating to go in in regards to the police officers not allowing parents to go in. And I want to say, I want to say a couple things on that. And the first is just remember the media wants everyone to hate cops. The media loves figuring out a way to make America hate law enforcement. And I have my theories on that. I think they're pretty clear at this point, but I I believe that the powers to be want a separation between law enforcement and the people. Because as they continue to push further and further and further with their radical agendas, like Joe Biden saying, a nine millimeter will blow the lung out of your chest and it's just too high of a caliber. Even though your 308 deer rifle has 85% more kinetic energy than a nine millimeter. And I'm not a gun guy. You don't have to be a gun guy to understand these things. But my whole point is, I think they have some, some plans ahead for us and I think it behooves them to have a police force that feels like the, the, the public does not support them. And I feel like it behooves them to have a public that feels like the police do not support them. So I'll, I'll ask you guys to please let all the facts come out before we crucify these cops for not going in and saving our babies because I've done lots of raids. I've cleared lots of buildings and I can tell you when we make entry into a structure, especially if it's like a a high risk warrant. And I did a lot of that stuff in Los Angeles. If you're making a dynamic entry and you're, you're, you're breaching and maybe you're, you're banging the room or whatever. If we're doing a dynamic entry, we have perimeter set up. When we set perimeter up, Perimeter has two jobs. No one comes in, no one gets out. And so all the videos going around the internet, could it potentially be that they were confronting the perimeter officers and maybe there was a team inside doing a dynamic clear? You know, in active shooter training, we are taught to go towards the sound of gunfire. 
but perhaps this individual holed up in a room somewhere and stopped shooting. Maybe he hid. And I'm here to tell you, if a guy's hiding from you, it can take a substantial amount of time to find him. But as usual on the Endless Endeavor podcast, I don't give cops a fucking pass either. And if the investigation does come out, and the investigation does show that you were too fucking coward to go in there and protect our children, well, now I have a serious, serious fucking problem with you. And guess who else is going to have a serious, serious fucking problem with you? A lot of people in the law enforcement community. I want cops to think about something. And, and that's why I'm not putting them on blast right now, because I don't think me just simply seeing memes and little news snippets saying what happened or what didn't happen is giving me the full story. And I'm learning to employ patience a little more as I get older. But if there is any truth to the fact that cops were hesitant to go in, I want you guys to think about something as a police officer. You chose this profession. And why did you choose it? I didn't choose the profession of law enforcement to write tickets or tell people that they, they can't park here at the airport or tell homeless people, hey, move along. You can't charge your phone here. This is a private business. All the bullshit that you do day in and day out that becomes monotonous. That's not why you're a cop. You're a cop because at some point you know that you are going to have to be the protector of your community. And you know that there are going to be people at some point in your career that are depending on you. Members of your community that are going to need to depend on you to lock up the bad guy or chase down the active shooter or find the person that molested my child. Dealing with the monsters of society is what attracts people to law enforcement. Getting rid of the monsters of society is what attracts people to law enforcement. And if you're attracted to law enforcement because it's a six-figure salary and it comes with some good benefits, please, and I'm not saying this pejoratively, please consider Amazon. Not everybody is cut from the same cloth. Not everybody is ready to confront evil face to face. And if you're not ready to confront evil face to face, this profession is not for you. Because the opportunity to kick down a door and chase a motherfucker that is killing our babies, the opportunity to do something like that is something you should fucking revel in. There's nothing that's going to give you more honor than chasing down a monster that's victimizing our children and making him the fucking victim. I used to fantasize about that shit as a cop. If today's the day when some motherfucker thinks he's going to come in here and start shooting a bunch of people, he has no idea what the fuck's coming for him. You have to know that you are a warrior and you are ready to confront extreme violence with even more extreme violence. I used to think about active shooter scenarios. And if there was someone shooting up the airport or shooting up a school, I would dump three fucking mags in them. And then I'd take a fire extinguisher and I'd smash him in the fucking head so many times that it would turn to soup. Just pure animalistic rage defeating evil. To me, that sounds exciting because that is how we need to deal with people like this. If you're a motherfucker that thinks you're going to victimize our society, just know there is men out there that are ready to eat your fucking face. And I'll enjoy every fucking second of it. You think that you're going to make these kids run in fear? I'm going to show you what fear feels like. Because I'm going to rip your fucking throat out with my teeth. If you don't have those emotions towards an individual that would shoot 20 of our babies, 
you shouldn't be a police officer. You need to know that when it's time to turn it up to 10, bite down on your mouthpiece and understand I'm in a fucking fight. And guess what? Sometimes you lose fights. And today might be the day I take one on the chin. But I'm not going to cower. I'm not going to show fear. I'm not going to allow this person's actions to put me back on my heels. I'm putting that motherfucker back on his heels. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't, but that's all part of your chosen profession. So this isn't come down on cop hour or telling you guys that those cops are fucking bitches or the pussies. That's all going to come out. If they were bitches and they were pussies, they're not going to be able to hide from that. But I will ask you guys, instead of jumping to conclusions, Maybe all the videos we saw was simply a perimeter team. And that's possible. And you want to know what else about perimeter team? I fucking hated it. Anderson, you're on perimeter tonight. You're going to be on the the one four corner of the building. Fuck. I'm not going to tell my, my team leader. No, 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 no. I'm on entry team. Put someone else on the one four corner. That's not how it works. And so I see both possibilities being a very viable truth because I'm critical of a lot of cops that are weak hearted, that do not take their fitness serious, that do not take their ability to protect their community serious. I'm very hard on those cops and I know they exist. And if that's what you guys did, God fucking help you because firing you is not enough. But if there was a team of meat eaters in there trying to locate this guy while they were holding perimeter, maybe we need to give them a little grace. If you guys already know something that I don't know and you've drawn your conclusions, I understand that and I appreciate that and I respect that. But for me personally, I'm not gonna use this platform to put anyone on blast until we know what the fuck happened. And I'm just praying that they did not make the decision to abandon our fucking babies when they needed them the most. (sighs) Fuck. All right, guys. If you felt I had a, a, a lack of energy today or that I may have not been my typical crazy Anderson self, I'll tell you, because I like to be transparent with you guys and I like to give you guys the, uh, uh, an open door to my life because I think this platform is fun and interesting to be able to share my experiences with so many different people around the world. But last night I got my ass kicked at practice and it is one of the worst ass beatings I've had in as long as I can remember. And it kind of, it's kind of haunting me to tell you the truth because I don't get beat like that anymore. I get beat plenty. There are dudes that can beat me. Joao will beat me every time we slap and bump, but he doesn't beat the fuck out of me. And uh, I popped a rib out of place. I felt it completely pop out. And uh, I fell to the ground and I was like holding my side. And then I, I pushed it and I felt it pop back in. And I don't even know what that means. If you're a fucking doctor, please, please share with me because the rib doesn't feel like it's, It's, uh, I mean, it's not a joint per se. So what does that mean when it pops out? Does that mean that the cartilage that connected it tore or whatever happened? But, uh, I couldn't even get out of bed last night. I laid down and I had to, I had to get up and take a piss and Jenny had to pull me out of bed. My body simply wasn't working. It was fucking, it was actually kind of scary and frustrating. And then I had to tell myself, bro, you have a fucking popped out rib. Quit being a fucking pussy. Your buddy Andrew from three episodes ago has 40 broken bones. You have a popped rib. Stop being a fucking pussy. But as I sit here and record today, if I take a breath a certain way or I lean a certain way, it's like, uh, uh, uh. and just, just doing that for demonstration purposes actually hurt pretty fucking bad. So I'll wrap it up with that guys. Thanks for listening. Um, if you know someone that's in a dark place, please share and get them on the path to betterment. Help them get out of that hole. 
But more importantly, if you are that person, take it upon yourself. Join a jiu-jitsu club. Start pursuing passion. And what you'll find is before you know it, you've t- taken all the darkness out of your light, out of your life, and you've replaced it with light. And that's when you really start fucking living, man. <laughs>